I will thank you, Sherezade, for your presentation. I would like to say that I'm delighted to be here today. It's a pleasure being here at home. In this event, I would like to thank CyberCamp, Tatiana, the organizing committee of CyberCamp, for making it possible for me to be here. I live a bit far from here. I've been living there for in the US for four years. But the rest of my life I've lived here. So when I was, they called me before uh, summer saying, asking whether I was interested in giving the lecture here. I said yes, immediately. My name is Ismael Valenzuela. You can follow me on Twitter. I tried to be quite active there. So you can use it during the presentation. I've been working in this for almost 20 years. In this same city, not far from here, I created a company with other people and mention later on because there's a lot of talent here in Malaga and throughout the years they've worked in many things that may sound familiar for us we're going to give them our voice I started in 2001 I've worked in security now I worked for McAfee I've worked for with them for the last six years, last four in the US. I would like to speak not just about my experience, but through my experience I've had over the past years, I would like to explain some things that worked for me. And for those of you who are interested in working in cybersecurity, or perhaps you're already doing some things, these things may be useful to um, have a career or consider other things you may do. One of the first things I would like to tell you about is what meaning I give to the word hacker. Truth to be told, its connotations are a bit different compared to the, one, the connotations it had in the past. When we say hacker, we understand virtually a criminal someone who accesses another system, another computer without authorization and it steals data and uses them with legal purposes. But the original definition of hacker was a different one. Very recently I attended a conference with Walter Isaacson who wrote a series of interested, interesting books. He is known in the US because he wrote Steve Jobs' biography. And in this book, Innovators, he speaks about the people that change the industry, computing, microchips, computers, the internet, people like John Paul Newman, Ada Lovelace, Bill Gates. And he explains how these people were originally hackers, but not hackers in the sense of accessing other computers illegally, but hackers in the sense that they did things that seemed impossible. They were geniuses. The word hacker comes from a, uh, a group of freaks, geeks. They were technical people. They belonged to a group of uh, electrical train modeling in the MIT in Boston and in the 40s these people among them there were a series of people that just wanted trains to look good and everything looked pretty to brag about it and others were interested in seeing what was going on below the model the cables, commuters, the electrical part of it. So there were, back then there were no circuits the way we know it today. We know them today, but they wanted to know how this worked. This curiosity is part of the uh, hacker philosophy. Knowing how things work, dismantle them, assemble them again, and they reached to, they found a hack, some trick, something intelligent that may not be elegant, but it made that object that perhaps was not designed with that purpose worked in a different way. Sometimes it, would, it was even a joke. Over the past years, I've worked with people that worked with this person in the 40s, Grace Hopper. She was called Amazing Grace. 
and she's known because she was the first person that invented she was the person that invented compilers if you use compilers the person that invented this was this person she was a mathematician in the 40s she worked uh, for Harvard University and she embodied the original hacker spirit she was seven and she disassembled the clocks she found around and she wanted to know how the clocks worked she wanted to know about the mechanism her mother said that after the ninth clock she said okay stop I'll explain you how it works and one of the things she said and this is part of the hacker philosophy hacker spirit it's not being uh, comfortable with something. They don't think that things had worked the same way all the time and sin. if things work, please don't touch it. This was this non-conformity with things. And they said, you need to try different ways of doing things. That's the basis of innovation, creativity. Not just accepting how things have been done your whole life. One of her most famous quotes is that in order to think differently, she had a clock on the wall uh, which was working anti-clockwise. In order, she wanted to think about this. She was a bit of a rebel. She was against established things age 34 she joined the US Navy she weighed four kilos she was four kilos below the required minimum weight back then so if you have the opportunity to read this book it's interesting but this somehow romantic definition of hacker it's not the one we have today today the definition we have it's more like this it's something that creates fascinations but also fear the terrorist actions behind this, some governments with very bad intentions, industrial espionage, ransomware. You may have suffered that on your system. Military groups, the famous APTs, persistent advanced threats, things that we hear about in the news. We have journalists devoted to uh, cybersecurity. We have Mr. Krebs' blog in the US. He's always sharing news about criminal groups, advanced attacks, etc. Over the past years, we see on the news always the same thing. There was, there's always something related to elections, Governments interested in modifying election results, hacking in Russia against the US. That's something that's on the news, on the papers. A few years ago, this was unthinkable, and today it's part of a daily life. And as the Secretary of State and the President of Libya said, we have an increasing need of professionals in security and the fact that you're here today and this room is packed confirms that security is something important and there are many people interested in entering the cybersecurity world. The statistics say that in 2019 1.5 million professionals will be needed. 1.5 more professionals than the offer we have. So if you're interested in working in this field, there will be jobs for you in the future. Some of the statistics say that in 2021, the shortage will be twice that number, 3 million. 3 million professionals in cybersecurity. So for many years, people have asked me, oh, how did you start in cybersecurity? I would like to share some of these things and give you some recommendations. I, wouldn't, I don't want to say advice, because you have to choose your own path, but some things that have been helpful for me 
and after some years I said, oh, that, this thing that I did, it, I didn't think it was important, but it was. Well, actually one of the things that we are seeing is a great demand, not only part of uh, public and private companies, so this is a company in California asking for or posting a job listing uh, for a person experiencing Hadoop. And this is uh, asking pe that person to have more than six years of experience. So do not get desperate. In many cases, employers or recruiters don't know what they are talking about because this technology is only six years old. So therefore, there is no one with more years, the, more than nine years of experience in this uh, uh, field or technology. So, well, there are new things all the time up there and we all have to be updated, including employers. So, and now I'd like to share with you some hacks. And uh, takeaway message from this uh, presentation is think like a hacker. That is to say, make possible something that looks um, impossible today. First of all, and which is very much related to hacking philosophy, is be curious, have a curiosity in things. And here, can, well, when I had, well, my first PC, my father bought it to me when I was 13 years old. My father bought Olivetti 286. It had one megabyte RAM memory and 40 megabytes uh, hard drive. I remember at the time, I had a friend, and he went like, 40 megabytes hard drive, you would never ever feel it. Yeah, you're laughing at that, isn't it? So nowadays, we will fill up that hard drive with just with an attachment, uh, with power presentation. But at that time, that was a huge storage capacity. I remember the floppy disks from MS five we didn't even have windows at the time and i was playing around with basic and uh, well those programs that today we would refer as artificial intelligence okay they well the computer was asking me my name and repeated it and i was like fascinated as i would my computer is talking to me and as i say i was more and more curious into all that i started uh, reading and then we had windows 3.1 with floppy disks you use well the program came in installation floppy disks several of them and we didn't even have a mouse at a time when windows were released we used to log on to the internet through a modem uh, causing significant noise and, and as I say, I started to be curious and I wanted to find out how all that worked. So this is the curiosity that drives hackers forward. What happens when you change a bit on the capacity of a protocol? What happens when that package that goes through the network is changed? And I was extremely interested in finding out what this was all about. So those of you who are older may remember finding this type of manuals in the, on the internet. So Carlin Maynell, does it sound familiar to any of you? Well, perhaps I'm the weirdo here. So this was controversial in the US. And this type of guidelines were known as harmless hacking, guide to harmless hacking. So actually, this was a help to understand how the internet and protocols worked. So at that time we started to have email and uh, well, 
by landing these guides, I could see that through Telnet I could connect to port 25 on an email uh, server where I could read or my email just by typing it, command line. To me, that was fascinating. Nothing to do with nowadays hacking, but that curiosity helped me learn how these protocols and the internet works. The, my presentation will be available, and if you are interested in finding out more, well, you may get hold of these uh, publications back from 1995, telnet, email, ports, etc. And also around that time, I started to learn more about Linux operation system. And when uh, there was a group of people at university who were training other people on Linux after teaching hours. So I started with MS2 with command line, and then I could see that while well, using mouse was like too simple. So I just, and Linux allowed me to implement many of the things that I was learning through these guides. And as I say, I got together with this group of people And then at that time, there were also, I offered, I volunteered to uh, create a website. And I bought my first book on HTML and I started to learn about PSP databases. It was not ex exactly the same thing that I was learning at university, but anyway, I was curious about it. I was third year university, technical engineering degree. And then I saw an ad. Fortunately, I don't have a photograph of it, but the, the ad said, if you can understand this, we will hire you. And that was coding PHP, uh, using a database. And because I had some clue about it, I knew what it was about. And I was there with a friend, and I said, oh, that's a database. And I said, OK, please. What? Send in your CV. And I said, well, I'm still at university. I don't think they will uh, consider it. And I, well, then I gave it a thought. And then I said, well, why not sending in my CV? So that day I came home and I wrote my CV. Well, I had no experience, but I just told them what I was doing, what I was playing around with, practicing sent that in and then when i came back home later on my mother told me you got a call from a company who is interested in meeting you so i visited i went to the company on monday and then they gave me a job part-time in the morning i uh, had that job and then in the afternoon i uh, used to go to university and it gave me a great opportunity to put into practice many of the things that I uh, uh, had learned and that I was learning. I'm really glad to see here some of my colleagues in that company at that time. So we started a project known as topfootball.com and way before that, 1999, five years before Facebook was launched, in Malaga, a uh, digital platform was being created uh, where through a forum you could uh, sign in and create your own profile and that platform was fascinated. I, and then the company, they asked me to uh, be responsible for their servers, application server, web server, database servers, and of course at that time well, uh, the data had to be protected. And everything that I was learning by myself could be put into practice as a result of that. And then also interesting, and 
I'd like to share with you. At university, there was a group, HAP, HAC, UMA. And it was not a group created to hack university, but just to share information about IT security. So this was back in 1996, 97, 98. Some of the people in that group were uh, university students, and one of them in the firm posted. We have found a vulnerability in uh, public administration and TT. Please take a look at it. And then again, curiosity. We got really curious. And the problem that they had was not that the actual server has been hacked. It was hosted here in a company in the industrial park, and then it was the admin that had made a mistake and had indexed the number of data that did not belong to the public administration entity where you could just log in the website and then you could do search and you could get to data uh, hosted in other servers, let us say, of a doubtful reputation, so to speak. And then we took a look at all that. And because I knew about internet uh, security, I could see that the that port 1433 was exposed to the internet. And you know what often uh, you can find in this port? Well, SQL databases. So that should not be there, that, should, that part should not have been exposed because often there are firewalls up, but the problem was greater than that. So you remember that at the time you used to install SQL uh, user server 2000, and when you were doing the installation, they asked you for, to enter a password for the admin, for the system admin. But the problem was that that password was optional. As you can see, it was highly recommended to enter non-black ink password, which is kind of unthinkable today. Many people on the internet had the uh, servers with no protection whatsoever, and anyone could log in to the server only by using the username SA. And the rest of the servers in that public administration entity were also exposed. But to summarize, well, at that time that was uh, made big news. And when I found that out, I talked to the people who were responsible for that service. They solved the problem right away. They, cut, they closed the port. And then the CO2 of the G2 group, the company where I was working, gave me the opportunity to offer this type of uh, red team uh, services or ethical hacking, so this type of advice to be provided to companies who wanted to be secure. And now we're talking about the end of uh, 2000, early 2001, when there were only few companies in this uh, country offering this type of services. It was where well, we were pioneers to speak and now when we look back well we could see that we were the first company to offer these services and now what kind of free comment to you well this is a photograph in the garage of my home and well i always have uh, some time of machine at home so nowadays this is much easier to do we have the cloud and this is an intel nook which is a very small pc like a size of a book where you can run virtual machines and my suggestion is set up your own lab find a machine which is old or i don't know that you only use for video gaming and uh, that you can use to 
create your uh, lab, install the access, which is a free program that you may install in any PC and where you can create your own net. Install that from scratch. Challenges. Install Linux from scratch. Compile. Download from the sources. It will be painful. It will not work right away. You will have to devote time to it. But by doing that, you are learning how things work. This is the hacking philosophy. That is to say, knowing how things work from scratch. Create a small, well, uh, Windows domain. Uh, you may use it for uh, some time and you will be kind of creating something which is very similar to a network in a company and then try to uh, secure it. So use the workstations in Linux and once we've done that, try to hack the system and see which is the hash, the evidence that is left behind so that you better understand what are the actual needs of organizations out there. And if something is, uh, well, is you find something unexpected, celebrate it, because very easily will help you out uh, in the future. Nowadays, I can see many young people wanted to become hackers, knowing how to hack things, but sometimes we forget where we come from. And learning from history is not about learning how to uh, work in a switchboard or anything like that. But now, I would like to recommend this book to you. Cliff Stoll was a physic working for Berkeley, California, and he was not a good uh, physicist and he was sent out to the IT uh, lab and they said okay well let us see if he better performs there and then when the IT guys when he joined the group of them he said okay I think well he's not very good at computers but he's a good physicist so later on I will tell you about marketing, how to sell yourself. Well, he was asked to take care of an accounting system. So imagine, at that time, uh, this person was working for the university, you were a researcher, and you were using big frames, huge computers to log in. You had to run your applications, you have to make calculations, and after that, You received kind of like a payment slip saying, well, this is uh, how this is the bill. Okay, this is how much you have spent. Okay, uh, and therefore you pay per use. And then reviewing the accountability of this system, he detected that the numbers didn't work, uh, woke up, and then there was. Uh, Dead or six seventy cents. That is to say, someone has used the lab and had not been charged for that. We were talking about seventy cents only, which is like a minor amount of money. But because he had a hacking mindset, he said, "Okay, I'm going to research this." And I said, "Well, I will just have a good time, and then I will learn about the system." Um not going to tell you everything that happened, but one year later it happened that Marcus Heiss was arrested in Germany and he was a person who was logging in, he was a non-authorized person and he was hacking the servers at Berkeley University and all that jump to the ARPANET, which was just a network connecting and bringing together a number of universities and the governments in the U.S. And from there, it jumped to the Department of Defense in the U.S., from where this criminal was 
stealing sensitive data from military projects, selling that out to the uh, KGAV, okay, Russian spies, and in exchange of money and cocaine. So that was 1986. So nothing to do with the IPTs that we are seeing nowadays. But Okay, this is nothing new, but nowadays we know much more about it. With this, I mean that all this started a long time ago. So, well, if you read this book, you will not find many information about the tools that they use because there were no intrusion, uh, intruder detection or artificial intelligence, but uh, same situation. Attackers, defenders, and always people behind all that. Strategies or even the tactics haven't changed that much. And he used something that we're using nowadays, honeypots. So this idea was used by this person before he created a fake military project and put it in that IT system so that the attacker, attacker went there, tried to download a file, and because it was a large file, it took the attacker a long time to download the file. And then, as the attacker was downloading the file, FBI and police forces in Europe managed to trace this guy in Germany. So this is not about tools, this is just about your mindset. And this guy is a clear example of that. So it's important to know history. History shows you the basics. So, well, sometimes I'm tired of people uh, trying to pretend that what we do is extremely difficult, that it is rocket science, as they say in the US. This is not rocket science. This is not quantum physics. This is not that complex. Not at all. The only thing you need to know is be aware of basics. So I have a friend who is a SANS fellow, well known in ethical hacking, and he says the following, information security is nothing but the inspired application of fundamentals. First of all, you have to be aware of the fundamentals and then knowing how to apply them. And this is what you get from experience. But Often we don't have the experience because no one has given us the opportunity to gain any experience. That's why it becomes all the more important to create, to set up your own lab at home and to experiment with all that. Um, what about learning the fundamentals? I'm a practical person, I'd like to offer this list of references to you. As I said, you will be receiving my presentation. So this is a long list of uh, books to read for life. You will not have to read them all, but they've been classified as basic, advanced themes, interested in learning about networks or OS. I have to thank Javier Lopez from University of Malaga. He was my teacher. For many years, he's been carrying out wonderful work in the shadow, teaching people uh, at the time, well, people say TCP, IP, oh, this is really boring. After years, I've realized that there were the fundamentals. If you are not aware of the fundamentals, if you are not aware of protocols, protocol headers, how they work, very unlikely you will succeed at uh, doing any hacking. At the end of the day, everything goes through the network. It's very important to understand how networks, Linux, Windows work. So these are the fundamentals. Analysis methodologies. Nowadays, the industry in general is investing huge amounts of money in security. And hot topic nowadays is SOC, security operating centers. That is to say, having a security organization where people are monitoring what is happening on a daily basis to defend themselves from uh, attackers, response incidents, forensic analysis, intelligence. And I want to, well, some people say, I want to do intelligence. Well, that requires understanding of the fundamentals, but also to have a strategic thinking. And this is about knowing the impact of all that has in your business and on that that goes beyond the 
technology side of it. And you can find all that in books. It's very important to get trained and also know this. When you have a problem that to be analyzed, how to have an open mind to it. Uh, think like a hacker. Think about what you are seeing. Have you seen it before? You may have seen it before, but may not be similar. Hypothesis, hypothesis generation. There is a method which is very interesting, ACH. Analysis of competing hypotheses. Uh, you may visit my website. I have uh, mentioned that or that is offered in my website. So CIA uh, offers uh, steps to carry out investigations and that you can use in your research. This is more about psychology, how our brain works, how to analyze complex situations. This is a situation you will find yourselves in when you will be defending the security of an organization. Another recommendation is learn at least two programming languages, Bash, Linux, PowerShell, Windows, and as I say, even in to get PowerShell, Windows PowerShell in toasters. Now with the IoT, uh, well, these languages are widely used nowadays, especially now with cloud services. Everything is going to the cloud, and well, these scripting languages help you control all that. So it's very important that we learn programming languages because we are having more and more data, and machine learning, big data, that will become increasingly important. Also very important, learn the language of the business. I learned that with all the companies where I worked. Sometimes we are just uh, technicians. We like to play around and we like to kind of speak in our own language, a language that we have kind of developed ourselves. But this is what Cliff Stoll uh, said in an event he took part to last year. And he said, when I discovered this mismatch in the accounting of the Berkeley University, I contacted the FBI and I told them that I have found this account. And then, as I say, I told the FBI, we have a hacker. We have a person who is logging from somewhere in the world. We have to trace this person. And then the FBI asked, how much did he steal? And then he answered, 70 cents. Okay. and. FBI laughed at him and I said, well, by the time this person has stolen a significant amount of money, come back to us. And that, that gave him food for thought. And he said, what is actually important is to know how to tell the story. So, so that, that story is compelling. What's behind that story? And this is what actually it's important to us. These are some newspaper articles. So Sergio de los Santos is the person with a great influence nowadays. He is the director of research uh, lab in Telefonica. He is here in Malaga. We went to university together. Person who helped me get to join G2 security. And as I say, we are talking about language. Then at that time, we wanted to sell penetration testing. Many people did not understand why penetration testing was needed. So at that time, 20, uh, 2021, okay, people did not understand the importance of it, although some companies were doing that proactively. I could be interested, but who else? Uh, should be interested in it as well. So very important, marketing and 
to sell more. You may say, no, no, I'm a technical person. But even if you're not interested in marketing or selling, if you don't own a company, we all uh, we are our own brand and we will be carrying our own brand forever. One of the things that we sometimes miss is to make all the talent that is available in Malaga known. There are, there are very good, or highly talented people out there, either in Malaga or also across Spain. And this is a story I like to tell, because back in 2001, I remember after spending many months trying to sell our services from Malaga, there were no big companies that wanted to buy our security services. We went to Madrid, to Barcelona, to get ourselves hired. And one day, a big public administration in this country called me. And they said, Ismail, we need your services. We want to hire you because we're being attacked by the Chinese government. You can imagine. It was virtually my first professional job after creating my company. We had the coolest web page, brochures, and we, they call us, they tell us this. And I said, wow, it could be my first and last job. Because I thought it was way out of my league back then. So we met, and in three days, we needed to send a report explaining what we had uncovered. So we spent the whole weekend without sleeping, scanning those networks, trying to discover what these attackers had discovered in that network, how they got in. And I, after scanning and analyzing, I found a machine that I hadn't seen before. It wasn't connected all the time, but at that point, particular point it was connected. It was DMZ, and I find a similar, a page similar to this one, not exactly this one. This has nothing to do with a particular government hacking. It was the worm called Codred. Back then it has an interesting story. I have, don't have enough time to explain it. It was a Chinese military plane taken down by the American government that didn't have this type of regulations. The Chinese government retaliated, created this worm that infected Solaris machines that scanned and infected machines in the internet and left behind this message hacked by Chinese. It was a worm that took advantage of a vulnerability in the internet information service, service and left this message. Something that seemed impossible back then. It wasn't that complex, but it required patience. We needed to know what was going on in the world back then, and one of these things was this worm. And one of the things I learned back then, it, was, it helped me a lot to understand about business. I had the opportunity to try to do the penetration test, the audit, the advising, but at the end of the day, hacking, attacking, red teaming is useless if you do not improve the company, the security of the company, the blue teaming. These terms are use, used in the military world in the US, red team attacks, blue team defense. One of the things I learned, I've learned over the years, you don't need to be red or blue. Now people say purple teaming, which is the combination of these two colors. What does it mean? The important thing here is not being good at attacking or defending. The important thing is what do you get with this? How do you improve your company's security? That's what matters to people that's paying, that's maintaining the business. I've had the opportunity uh, to work to a hospital group in the city of New York with many public hospitals. The point I think is that you don't get to do your pen testing and you're the Dominion administra administration or the, you carried out a wonderful analysis 
what's the important thing here? The important thing for the hospital network is providing hospital emergency services to the citizens. And your work is supporting that in a way that you can protect the network and minimize the impact that any attack could have on those services that the organization is providing. So besides thinking as a hacker, you need to think about what's important for the organization that's hiring you, that's paying you, and that requires your services. This is risk management. About your personal brand. As I've said before, it's going with you wherever you go, so be careful when you use the media. At some point, we wanted to hire a technical person. They were very, very good. The organization took a look at their social media and they saw it had polemic comments and I could even say something else. So that's why the reason why the organization said we don't want to hire this person, although from a technical point of view, he or she was very good. And these things can stay in the social media for many years, so take care of your brand share, use things in GitHub so that people can see that. When you send your CV somewhere, people are going to Google your name. They're going to see what you've published. It doesn't need to be a very important lecture. It could, it could be just a small code, but I could say, okay, this guy knows a bit power sh about PowerShell, about uh, Python, he has an attitude of learning, of sharing, collaborating. People look for this kind of things. And this takes me to the next hack, write, share, collaborate. We started to do this a uh, very long time ago, G2. One of the first things we said was, let's create a newsletter about security. We want people to know about security. But there was something else. We wanted to learn ourselves. Why? Because when you write about something, what happens? It forces you to, it makes you think, it makes you analyze how you're going to explain it, how are you, how you're going to explain a complex thing such as this one to a non-technical audience, your parents, your brother. You have to use examples, you have to summarize the problem and that makes you understand it better and when you have to put it into practice you're going to have more knowledge. So start your own blog. Even if at the beginning you don't have readers, do it for yourself to start analyzing this type of things. Write about things you want to learn about. A few years ago, we started to do this. Sergio de los Santos, this dates back from 2002, Wayback Machine in the internet. You can find web pages from many, many years ago. They're not online anymore. It was sort of a bot in the internet that takes pictures of these pages and stores them. Andres Mendez, another friend of mine, we started together in G2 Security many years ago and he wrote articles about these things. Even before starting with us, he was present in the internet, Hag Uma. People wrote papers, you could collaborate. This was the original purpose of hackers, learning, collaborating, teaching others. And many of these things were published in a, pa in a magazine called Arroba and in manuals that were published for many years. I know what you're thinking. Many of you think, I have nothing people could care about. There are people who are far better than I am. That's called the imposter syndrome, and we all have it. I have it. I had it before coming up to the stage today. I thought, perhaps what I'm going to explain is not that interesting. We all feel this. We think we are here. This is what I know, and this is what I think others know. This is your perception. But reality is more like this. Each one of us has a different experience. We can tell something different. So don't be afraid, put it out there, share it. And once you share it, you'll see that people come to you and ask you and say, "How? oh, this is very important, the interesting. After working uh, in different countries in the Middle East, I went to New York. I needed to do this 
work. As a consultant, it's easy. You go, you give your consulting results, and you leave the problem to those working there. But I had to do this like the client. I had to manage a network of more than 60,000 IT uh, um, devices. And I needed tools to carry out remote anal analysis of the machines based on the problems I had back then. I created a small problem in Python. I uploaded to GitHub. I asked my boss, do you think I should share this? Yes, it's my, this is part of our philosophy. We need to share this with people because no one invents anything from scratch. If you've done something, you learned from someone, you inspired, we were inspired by someone. I shared it on the internet and I received email from all around the world, people saying that they were using it, that it was interesting, that it could be improved. Have you thought about the, doing this or that? And one day I was called to give a lecture in Sands, in a summit in New Orleans. I was called a black hat. I presented this um, two years in black hat, 2016, 2018. A project which, honestly, when I created it was nothing. It took me two days. But people thought it was useful. Many of the things you may do today, perhaps you don't think it's important. It was a little script that solves a very little problem. Share it and put your name there. Because that same problem, probably there's another person facing it in France, in Brazil, Argentina, India, Australia. And once you share it, people will see it and they can give you the opportunity to, to do other interesting things. So start to do that right now. Here at CyberCamp, you have a very good opportunity to start sharing to, to people around you and present your projects. So very briefly, do you speak English? Good English? Here in our CVs in Spain, when we have to state our level, we say, okay, medium high. But we've had the opportunity to hire people here in Spain working from home with very good salaries and we couldn't because they could read English, they understood English. They, they couldn't speak over the phone. They were not fluent enough. As simple as that. And it's a pity that you invest so much in your studies, in learning, and due to something as simple as this, because it's not that complicated you cannot get the job. These are some suggestions. It's not complicated. And last but not least, some which is part of Hacker philosophy is thinking in graphs, not lists. For those of you who are studying as T attackers, think in terms of graphs. If this technique is not working, I, use, I try this other one or this other one, and I keep on trying. As defenders, we're beaten by the attackers because we think in lists, in terms of lists. If I see A, I do B, C. But what happens if you see X and you don't have a handbook that tells you what to do? Things in graphs. So the important thing is not what I've just told you about what you have to do. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do. The practical side of this is try it, share, do things, some of these things we've said, but the important thing is looking for your own path. It's not about having a role, a degree. The important thing is what you do during the process, the people you will work with, you will learn from, what you can offer to offer other people, or other people that offer you. No one gets anything by himself, herself. Don't be afraid of failing. That's part of the learning process, and that will help you. And last but not least, find your balance. This is like the universe. Our work is like the universe. It's infinite and it's expanding. We will never finish it. Some people get depressed. There have been cases of suicide because you can easily get lost. Even if you work from home, you can lose your balance and devote every single second of your life to this. And that's not good. You need a, you need a balance. That's something I've learned throughout the years. My wife has taught me to balance things. That will turn you into a better professional too. You'll be a better person, a better professional. 
you'll be more successful in your job. This has been a special event for me, so I would like to thank everybody, and more particularly my family and my parents who are here today, for the first time in one of my lectures, because thanks to them, I was able to learn to have an open mind. I've been able to learn all the basic things which are much more important than any other technical thing you can learn. I would like to thank you, I would like to thank Inthibia. I think we don't have time left for questions. Yes, one question. We have time for one question, but no one dares. It's okay, I'll be here the whole day. If you want to talk to me, please feel free. And thank you very much.